but in the end, we uh, yeah also welcome questions, discussions, and hopefully it's uh, informative. So Sarah, we'll kick it off and then we'll tag team. Awesome. Thanks, Karsten. Um, yeah, there are so many things that we could say about the P5 process. The report itself is, well, I guess 80 pages, maybe 60 pages of meat, depends on how you how you think about it. What we wanted to do was present enough material so that we can have a discussion and, and conversation. But just starting out with why did we need a project prioritization panel in the first place? We're not the only field in science that goes through a process every once in a while and asks questions like, what's really important? How should we focus ourselves? What should our priorities be? That seems like a reasonable thing to do. Particle physics is particularly susceptible to not making those kinds of choices because, well, a few reasons. Um, we're working at extreme differences in terms of scales. And fascinatingly, examining the very, very small and examining the very, very large scales that we have in the universe, both of those push us to facilities that require huge collaborations, right? So we're a field that, that needs to think about investments in facilities. These things that we want to build, we might not yet have the technology for. It might require some planning for us to go after our interesting scientific questions. And we have the interesting um, complication and joy of true international collaboration, where we have to work across a lot of different kinds of borders. Um, we heard those of you who came to, to um, Roxanne's phenomenal physics club last week, also about how interdisciplinary we are in as a, a discipline. So there are so many reasons that we need to plan. And of course, what, what shouldn't go without being said is that budgets are constrained. We've learned some lessons collectively over our past uh, prioritization work. And what I've tried to do is be a good soul and present these in a positive light, but you could read between the lines in a negative fashion and think about things we want to avoid. What do we want to avoid as particle physicists as we think about our future budgets? We want to avoid being entitled. We need to recognize it's an honor and a privilege. Some fraction of the, the budget of the country is gonna go into this line of inquiry and that's fantastic. And let's do the best that we can as stewards of that fraction, right? We need to develop a fiscally responsible and compelling plan. And what we found is that the harder choices we make and the more responsible we are in these plans, the more opportunity we end up for growth because we're trusted as a discipline to be good stewards. And that's an interesting sort of balance for us to keep in mind as we think about project prioritization. Um, completing projects on schedule within the budget, that's how we build our credibility. What that means, and this is a lesson that's, that's hard, what it means is that when we do overrun budgets to some extent, we need to think about de-scoping rather than continuing to grow, right? which is an opportunity always for us to be more creative in terms of getting out our science. And then other lessons that we have to learn and relearn are how to keep our portfolio balanced. How do you keep opportunities for people to have an exciting new idea and act on it at the same time as committing to a long-term international facility? How do you keep the really big stuff and, and small stuff going simultaneously? Um, and one of the most important lessons that we get to highlight in this P5 process, because our, our charge enabled it, is to acknowledge that people are our most precious resource. Let me say just a couple of words about the prioritization process, because it starts out fun. We call this part the snowmass phase. People may have heard us talking about snowmass. That's because we used to go to snowmass for a couple of weeks in the summer. It was off season, so it was cheaper then. But a couple of things have changed. We no longer go to snowmass for three weeks in the summer and dream once a decade because snowmass is actually still expensive in the summer. It's just kind of a bad look also to run off to snowmass for this as we're thinking about not being entitled and being fiscally responsible. Um, and it's not possible for everybody to go to snowmass for, for that three week period. So now our snowmass process is spread out over a year or in the case of a pandemic, several years. And we meet as groups virtually sometimes coming together and dream what are our scientific questions? right? What are ways we can go after their answers? 
I'm gonna give you three examples. And only one of them is one that really wasn't considered as part of snow mass. This is a little bit like one of those wait, wait, don't tell me games where you make up um, things and you have to guess which one is a lie, okay? Use instrument parts of the ocean as a neutrino detector. Build a particle accelerator on the moon. Carson, I haven't slept enough. I forgot my third example. I had a third one that was really intense that was true. Okay, anyway, people talked about instrumenting parts of the ocean. I've slept less than he has over the last period of time. But anyway, other big ideas that people had? Um, oh, stick a, a laser interferometer into space. That's a real one, right? Lisa, let's go in that direction. Let's instrument the ocean. Okay, we haven't talked in real ways about particle accelerators on the moon, but when I say we dream in this stage, we dream big, and then a panel is formed. That's the particle physics, prioritiz particle physics project prioritization panel that says, let's take these dreams and we're gonna hand what the Department of Energy gives us as possible budget scenarios, and we're gonna fit what we can keeping in mind some principles that Karsten's gonna go into a bit. I have to say some P5 related history, and I'm excited to see that Charlie is actually um, connected, I think, to the Zoom. Um, beyond setting the project priorities, the, the, this P5 process that we has also um, sets the scope for what particle physics is. Our boundaries are squishy. How much do we push into astronomy and astrophysics? How much do we push into nuclear physics? Not in a way to push anybody out, I have to be super careful about this, but we have incredibly strong partnerships and common questions outside of what used to be seen as the core of particle physics. It's one of the most exciting things about what's happening in these areas of science is that we're working together from different directions. So we, we define the scope. Another thing I wanna point out is that Yale has really had significant leadership through this process. One of the most influential P5s um, that we've had uh, was led by Charlie Balte and actually defined for us the way that the Department of Energy even tries to organize the science that we do into cosmic intensity and energy frontiers. Even though we don't like to think about boundaries between us, we have to have some categories so that we can you know, um, ask for funding inside those categories. And then in this most recent P5, we were back again in a situation where um, Yale had real leadership um, serving with Karsten serving as deputy chair um, for this P5 process. And in the last couple of P5s, we've had two Yale people on the committee, which is really fantastic. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the science drivers that we come up with are gonna appear on grant funding applications. Um, and you know, when we apply for money, we're gonna be looking at them. So here's the panel. Um, there was an incredible amount of diversity in the panel in terms of the institutions that we cover. We have national labs, universities, different kinds of universities, including primarily you know, colleges, um, uh, international partners. And this just gives you a sense. Some of the slides that, that we have here, um, we're not gonna go through in a lot of detail. You know, We can come back to them if people have particular questions. But just so that you see, there, there was a 700 page summary of the snow mass outcome um, that really was important and fed into the process. Um, that snow mass report is where we started because that's where our colleague, the whole field sat down and said, this is what's important. This is what's exciting. This is what's potentially possible if we plan. And then we had a number of other ways through town halls and meetings where we gathered information and we met together in lots of hotels across the country without windows for long periods of time. Um, it, it was actually a really collegial, wonderful environment in, thanks in large part to um, Karsten and Hitoshi's leadership that, that kept us on track. Um, the previous P5 report, I just wanna put this up here because this, is, this came out in 2014. This is what we've been staring at and thinking about and planning around, okay? This is where we were in 2014. And it's helpful to think about what's changed. There's good news. There's a lot that's changed. Um, there's a lot that we've learned. And that was one of the things that we got to talk about and think about as a panel, right? The Higgs is no longer new. It is more mysterious than it was when we first um, looked at it. Um, because we understand it much better than we did. And, uh, you know, so the mysteries that we started out with have become more extreme, I think, and, and 
uh, more alarming. We're way beyond just thinking about neutrino mass in terms of what we have access to answering in the neutrino sector. Um, and then we've also tried to sharpen what it means to explore the unknown, which was always sort of a big catch bag, a useful large sort of catch all category, but we've moved on. Not, I don't want to dive into this, um, but I'm happy to talk about how you know Higgs physics has changed if people find that interesting. This actually heads into the report itself. Um, and you can see that we ended up with um, the quantum universe. Now, you may think that we're just catching a fad. You people, everybody's trying to grab onto quantum. If this were 20 years ago, it would have been the nano universe, right? But the reality is Hitoshi, our chair, wrote a paper called The Quantum Universe in 1980. Um, he's been on this for decades, right? And I, I think, uh, yeah, well, we have quantum field theory in our discipline. They're, they're, this is legitimate people. We're not just, just jumping on a fad, okay? But you can see that we have three categories and our science drivers map a little bit to the previous science drivers, except we've tried to branch out how do we actually um, go after the unknown in, in different ways? They're in the center, okay? Um, so that, but this is the overall structure that we have uh, for the report. Carson, I guess I'll just say a couple of words about, I've got three more slides and I'm gonna hand over to you. Um, the budget scenarios that we were given by the Department of Energy, it wasn't like Christmas, you know? Um, they said the good budget scenario is that Chips and Science Act is, is funded and you get a little bump because of that. So do you see this top line here by year? There, the, the slope is increased and then you get 3%, okay? So maybe you can keep up with inflation. That was what we're calling our baseline scenario. And then the other scenario that we were given um, is, you know, Sorry, but there's no bump and there's not quite inflation. There's a 2%, which in real dollars in terms of our spending power means that we have a, a decrease in what we can do. Um, so in some ways you could say this is really dire. Um, in other ways, it's remarkable what we can accomplish within the budget profiles that we've been given. And then what we do is think about, um, okay, let's um, you know, think about how much is actually gonna go toward projects. We are after all a project um, panel. You also have to think about, you know, research budgets and, and paying for people. Um, this is a sobering, mm, the green didn't show up, Karsten, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, okay, we'll see if we get to that. It turns out if you just look at the projects that, that are already ongoing, we saturate our, our project budget for the next couple of years. So we have to be really responsible, particularly early on in this plan in terms of what, what can come in. Um, what you can't see is the dramatic snow mass, what was asked for, you know, um, it, it actually went way, way, way above um, what our profile was. It was clear we were gonna have to say no to some things. But in order to get us in a better, oh, look at that. Um, that was what was proposed, subtracting some very, very large big ticket items that, that were a little bit unrealistic, okay? So this is just the potential, the really realistic stuff that we could have imagined doing, not including the onshore Higgs factory. Um, and another big difference that Karsten and Hitoshi brought with this panel was introducing a costing risk, risk and schedule panel that tried to help us understand, okay, if somebody tells you it's going to cost this much to do that, then, well, this is how much wiggle room there is on that estimate. And maybe you need to inflate that by 30%, right? Or that's a very mature um, estimate. So it's something that's safe to go with to make sure that when we plan out our projects, we don't have surprises that that um, get us off track. Karsten, I'm going to hand it over to you to continue with the principles. Okay. So yeah, so you've heard from Sarah that uh, the community dreams big. You saw the uh, a green plot and this is what everyone proposed and wanted to realize. So we had to think about how do you actually make a down select? How do you uh, define the criteria for selecting a program that's actually uh, realistic? So what we came up with were a number of um, yeah principles and uh, we wanted to make sure that we continue, of course, what has been uh, started. Uh, the US has had leadership in several areas. That's important to continue. 
uh, the U.S. has built facilities and uh, has existing capabilities. We wanted to make sure that we leverage the unique uh, capabilities there. Uh, the U.S. also pursues a number of national initiatives that have become really important in funding uh, some of our science. It's AIML, uh, quantum, yeah, microtechnology, things like that. And uh, it's important uh, that we have some alignment yeah, with these national initiatives. Developing a workforce is really important. And uh, lastly, we also have to look into the international context. As uh, Sarah mentioned, what we do is international. Most of the projects we do nowadays in particle physics are international. They have uh, big collaborations. And so we have to understand what the international partners do, where they go, and uh, how we play into this. And so, these were some of the guiding principles. We also wanted to strive for a balanced uh, program, balanced in terms of um, uh, size and the time scale of projects, um, uh, small, medium, and large, whether it's inside or outside the US, and uh, project uh, versus research, and current and future investments. You always have to think about, you have a pot of money, how do you distribute it over different areas, and uh, yeah, also in um, yeah, time. While we are called the physics um, uh, particle physics project prioritization panel, the chart allowed us to also think about workforce, the, the balance of the program as a whole. And I think that was actually a significant extension of the chart compared to some of the uh, previous um, yeah, P5 panels. For someone yeah. outside the field, could you clarify what project versus research means? Yeah, so I'll uh, get to that. So uh, particle physics, when we build experiments, uh, they are typically categorized as projects. Essentially, you built an accelerator, you built an experiment that's big enough, you call it a project, you have a scope of what you want to build, uh, you have a timeline, you have a cost associated with this. Research is usually what we scientists do. It's the money that supports students, postdocs, the data analysis, and so on. And what we'll see later on is in our field, typically uh, the budget uh, breaks down in three buckets, research, project, and operations. And operations is essentially what yeah, keeps the facilities uh, yeah, running. And the other challenges you have to balance is so that in every, any given year, you essentially don't exceed uh, yeah, the, the budget significantly. How do I advance? Oh, great. Yeah, so um, uh, we also wanted to uh, make sure that we have the right balance between experiments and facilities that we build, as well as uh, theory. One of the things that uh, uh, we have seen over the last few years is that there's a real erosion in the support of um, yeah, theory in the field. And uh, we actually have a recommendation yeah, to um, uh, yeah, address this. And uh, the concept of balance was really important. And uh, we have a plot that uh, essentially captures what we are uh, trying to recommend or what we recommended that uh, shows you where the field is currently and where we want it to go. And uh, this, these are two pie charts that uh, show you a snapshot of uh, the funding and how it's distributed in our field on the left-hand side, you have the current fiscal year 2023, and you see with yellow and uh, a gray, two big buckets of money that go into the development of the accelerator complex at Fermilab, and what we call the intensity frontier, which are the big neutrino experiments like uh, the Dune um, experiment. And on the right-hand side, you see where we envision the field going 10 years from now. So where we have healthy investments, in uh, projects that uh, yeah cover the cosmic frontier, that um, cover the high energy frontier, uh, R and D, uh, and so on. So that is uh, visually what we uh, um, were aiming to do with the report that we produced. Just a word on the theory funding. Uh, this is actually a plot that is not in the report, but we were allowed to show it in the talks. It gives you the theory of funding over the last few years, and you see that, especially at universities, yeah, the, yeah, the theory of funding has uh, uh, gone down quite a bit, which is the um, yeah great curve. And so uh, this is something when you think about an ecosystem in the field, 
this is not healthy. You, you need to invest in all areas of the fields to keep um, yeah, innovation up. So let me come to the report. We call it Exploring the uh, Quantum Universe, Pathways to Innovation and Discovery in Particle Physics. And um, we developed this illustration, which on the left-hand side is an illustration of the quantum world. You see uh, particles, wave packets uh, yeah, streaming out. On the right-hand side, you have an illustration of the cosmic side. You see dark blobs of dark matter. You see galaxies. You have um, impressions of the expansion of the universe. And uh, when you bring those together and at the intersection, of these two areas, you um, uh, find or you have a chance also of finding new physics. And this is what this um, yeah, mural is um, yeah, supposed to illustrate. And uh, the logo that we developed for this P5 is really a representation of this uh, mural where these two areas, the very small and the very large, come together and uh, intersect. In the report itself, this is the um, um, yeah, outline of the report. We uh, give a recommended uh, program. We talk about uh, the different areas, the quantum realm, and one of the themes is deciphering the quantum realm. We talk about illuminating the hidden universe. This is studying the cosmic side. And uh, then the intersection is exploring new paradigms uh, in physics. And we also break out uh, two additional areas, and that's investing in uh, the future of science and technology, as well as yeah, the workforce and a technologically advanced workforce for particle physics and the nation. Again, making the case that what we do is actually relevant uh, yeah, for society as a whole. So let me just uh, go through yeah, some of the highlights of the recommendation to give you a sense of uh, what's in there. And what you will see is that uh, in the next few slides, we will actually stick to the words that we have in the report. They were carefully uh, chosen and uh, the panel debated for hours uh, on end about essentially every sentence that ended up uh, in the report. And um, Sarah was, was saying that, yeah, we spent a great deal of time together. And um, a couple of days ago, I added up all the meetings. We had the in-person meetings. And I'm afraid to say it was like nine weeks of in-person meetings, not counting the uh, endless Zoom meetings uh, on top of that. So there's um, uh, every sentence here is trying to reflect something and has an intent. So what we envision for particle physics for the next decade is a new era of scientific uh, yeah, leadership centered on decoding the quantum realm, unveiling the hidden universe and exploring novel paradigms, balancing current and future large and mid-scale projects with the agility of small projects, realizing that you can't just always build bigger things. You also need small things to train people and to be nimble. And uh, that this is uh, crucial to our vision. We emphasize the importance of the workforce investing in it and enhancing computational and technological infrastructure and acknowledging the um, global nature of particle physics. We have to work with our international partners. And um, we also call out sustainability in project uh, planning. So this is also something that has come up throughout the snow mass process and beyond when you think about big projects that go on for years and decades, you have to worry about the workforce, the time scale, the overall resources, but also what impact does it have on our planet and uh, on society. And so if we put all of this together and we do it in a responsible way, we might get some new insights uh, into the universe. So before I um, yeah, give you some of the detailed recommendations, I also wanted to call out the broad program of particle physics that we have here at Yale. We have a very large, um, uh, we have a sizable theory group with um, you know, Tom Applequist, Walter Goldberger, Ian Mold, David Poland, and uh, Vitek Siba. And uh, they are covering many areas of uh, high energy theory, uh, Keith, Sarah, and uh, Paul, of course, involved in um, the ATLAS experiment um, at CERN and 
They also have involvement in mu 2 e uh, Vena is a collaborator on the ice cube experiment and uh, on the cosmic side. Uh, we have, yeah, Larry Gladney with role in um, the room observatory and uh, Laura with yeah her contributions to CNBS4 and uh, yeah, the cosmic side. And I have a role on the neutrino side. So we're actually covering many of the things that you will see in the reports and in the recommendations that uh, have come out of this report. So the first thing we recommend as uh, um, for the field is that we continue and exploit the current experiments. And uh, you heard the previous P5 report was titled, uh, was titled Building for Discovery. So it initiated a number of large uh, projects and uh, we recommend that we complete those independent of any budget scenarios and get the science out. And so we say as the highest priority, independent of budget scenarios, complete construction of projects, support operations and research to enable maximum science. And in particular, we call out the high luminosity um, LHC upgrades. And that's a way to uh, yeah, extend the LHC operations, detect the upgrades. Um, the completion of the Dune experiment and uh, PIP2 is an accelerator uh, associated with that, and then the Vera Rubin um, yeah, Observatory. So these are high profile projects that uh, are just getting to the point where they can be completed and the science will come out in the next decade. There are also a number of smaller um, experiments that are ongoing, especially on the neutrino side, dark matter side, and um, uh, yeah, cosmic side, and all of these uh, yeah, should be continued. And uh, when we talk about yeah, medium or smaller scale experiments here, um, these are essentially uh, things that cost more than yeah, $50 million for yeah, DOE, but they are less than yeah, the billion dollar category of experiments or major initiatives that I talked about um, earlier. And one of the things that was has been really difficult for the field is that some of the big projects um, have had cost increases. And uh, Sarah mentioned the um, cost committee that we had over the last few years, we had to deal with projects that increased by a factor of pi. And if you have a billion dollar project and there's a factor of pi uncertainty in that, that can really um, yeah, hurt your field. And so uh, we make a recommendation here that the agency should work closely with the projects to monitor that. Yeah, Emily. Does the color coding mean anything here? No, the uh, color coding, the blue and the red, is just to uh, make it uh, yeah more easily readable. Okay. So, yeah, there is no uh, um, other, yeah. So basically, the current program that we have and that was initiated with the past P5, we want to continue and um, explore it. But beyond that, and this is where things uh, you get exciting, we uh, recommend some new major projects uh, for the field. And uh, again, coming back to the um, importance of balance, we wanted to do something that spans essentially all areas of um, yeah, particle physics. And we talk about this here that these are projects that study nearly all fundamental constituents of our universe and their interactions. And those projects are now rank ordered. Some of the recommendations we have are not rank ordered, but those projects are now rank ordered. And uh, the highest recommendation that we have for the field is to um, complete or to build a project. It's called CMBS4. It's a cosmic microwave background uh, your project, which looks back at the earliest moments of the universe. So it gives you access to actually highest energy scales, very early times. And it's a project that requires telescopes at both the South Pole and in uh, Chile. And uh, we think that this is something that could really give us uh, insights into yeah, the early times of the universe. We also recommend extending um, uh, Dune as a neutrino program, uh, but not the full proposed second phase. We re-envisioned this by boosting a beam and just having one of the uh, additional detectors, and that would give you access to CP violation in the neutrino sector. You can measure the mass hierarchy 
and really test if there are only three neutrinos or if there's more uh, physics. And then on the energy uh, frontier side, we recommend the Higgs factory. Now, the Higgs was discovered yeah, more than 10 years ago. Uh, now, there have been studies of the Higgs at the LHC. And uh, now the goal is to understand in detail the physics of the Higgs and um, yeah, do precision measurements uh, with, with that. And there are proposals around the world to build what they call a Higgs factory. One proposal is at CERN. Another proposal is to do a linear collider as a global project in Japan. And there's even a proposal in China. Um, and we recommend that the US should engage in one of the offshore projects. And we call out either the CERN proposal, which is FCC, or the linear collider. And uh, we actually recommend that there will be a panel at some point to decide um, and make a decision which way um, yeah, to go. And then we recommend an additional dark matter experiment, that's so-called generation three dark matter experiment that uh, builds on the current achievements and gets us down to the point uh, where you can probe um, uh, all the phase space to a background level uh, which we call the neutrino fog. Basically, one uh, when you build really sensitive experiments, at some point, the neutrinos become the background to your dark matter measurements. And uh, so we think with the next generation, the G3 dark matter experiment, we can reach that limit. And that would ultimately test whether WIMPs are a possible dark matter candidate or not. In addition to that, we also have a suite of experiments in here, smaller experiments, for axion searches as yeah potential other dark matter candidates, and then we recommend um, extension of Ice Cube, which is a neutrino telescope at the South Pole currently, with a generation two to uh, yeah continue neutrino astronomy to continue neutrino astrophysics, and they also have some sensitivity to um, dark matter. Um, so. In a report like this, uh, we make recommendations on the science, we make recommendations on budgets, and perhaps as a side note for those of you who are not so familiar with this, um, the agencies work very differently. DOE has a plan, they have a budget, they have a mission, and we essentially have to fit into their budget profile. NSF is an agency that responds to proposals, and so uh, what you when you read the report, you find that we comment on the science of projects that are NSF supported, but we don't give any specific budget guidance because they handle their internal budgets very differently than um, that the Department of Energy. One of the things that we brought in, and this is recommendation number three, is we wanted to seed the ability to have small projects in particle physics. So we have a recommendation um, that calls out the creation of a new program in uh, DOE. Call it, it's called Advancing Science and Technology Through Agile Experiments, ASTE. And the idea here is that uh, on a regular basis, basically you can propose something and you can build small experiments at the level of maybe up to 20 or $25 million. And so the idea is that the advancement in the field is not just tied to the big flagship projects that take a decade or two decades to realize, but that uh, on the time scale uh, that might be relevant to many of your careers, you, you can also um, yeah, uh, make uh, progress and uh, respond to new opportunities, new physics uh, opportunities. Aste is actually uh, the name, the Latin name for sphere. So the idea was uh, have something that's very targeted. It can go after the science and uh, it's fast and responsive. Um, so in addition to that, we have recommendations to continue things like the NSF mid-scale um, yeah, program and various um, upgrades and uh, at the um, mid-scale level, uh, supporting the continuation of DESI uh, to, to study uh, cosmic evolution and have an upgrade to um, LHCB and um, yeah, gravity. Recommendation four also 
goes towards supporting the entire field. So even though we're called a project prioritization panel, we realize that to really make progress, you have to invest in R&D and you have to invest in the various areas that actually drive us forward. And so we have a recommendation here that talks about supporting a comprehensive effort to develop the resources, theoretical, computational, and technological uh, that are essential to our 20 year vision for the field. And this includes an R&D program that could eventually uh, produce new accelerator designs to get up to a 10 TV um, collider. And so the idea here is that unless we also invest in the R&D, we won't have something 10 years from now to look at new opportunities, new projects um, yeah, down the road. And so I'm not going to go through all of the details there. You can look at this in the report, but we we are, uh, we spell out a number of investments in accelerator R&D, theory, uh, instrumentation R&D, cyber infrastructure, as well as developing a plan for the evolution of the Fermilab um, accelerator complex. So that maybe sometime in the longer term future, 20, 30 years from now, there could be a new collider at um, yeah, Fermilab. And so what we try to do with these recommendations is have something that gives us sign for this decade, exploits the current experiments, prepares us for the future, and uh, also uh, allows us to start the construction of new experiments. And as Sarah pointed out at the very beginning, uh, people are the life and the blood of this field. And we have to be really mindful about how we support people going uh, through the next decade. And so we have one recommendation that talks about the workforce. Do you want to shape this and talk about that? Yeah, sure. So um, for this one, uh, like we said, the charge for this P5 was actually um, broadened to include this category. And we were looking at um, how do we develop the workforce? How do we broaden the engagement, broaden participation, and then also support ethical conduct in the field? Mm -hmm. um, for people who aren't aware of the APS ethics guidelines, I recommend taking a look. The ethics guidelines in APS um, are very strong. They pull in the way that we treat each other more broadly than you might be thinking in terms of an ethical framework. But it's a, a really it was a nice framework for us to think about in terms of um, how we can actually reduce barriers to participation. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these, and I promise we're almost done. There's just recommendation six. Is that right, Karsten? And then we can open up to questions. Maybe makes sense. Um, but for this one, we were standing on a really strong platform because the snow mass process, that dreaming phase that I talked about, um, actually added a bunch of frontiers in this round. We talked about the energy frontier, the intensity frontier, and the engagement frontier that Charlie Balte's um, P5 came up with as a way for us to organize ourselves. We also had the community engagement frontier that talked about um, things like diversity and inclusion, public engagement with our science um, and, and a whole range of things that, that might be beyond what people think about as central to doing physics, but actually enable, uh, um, enable us as human beings to do physics at all. You can see the list of things here that really comes from the recommendations in that snow mass report to make sure that we understand how to be treating each other and that we hold ourselves accountable um, and each other accountable um, to have a, an environment where people really can thrive and do good work. This, this also thinks about um, pathways, career pathways, to support people who are, are doing jobs like um, the you know, critically important research scientists, hardware and software engineers, technicians, other professionals without whose expertise we wouldn't be able to um, solve the kinds of problems that we come up against in, uh, in particle physics. And then finally, something that's really exciting 
um, but is common sense at the same time. The idea that if you have an ongoing experiment, your plan to communicate that experiment is part of your budget in terms of your operations, okay? And this is an acknowledgement of the fact that the public funds our science and owns our science. We have a moral obligation to make sure that we're engaged in, in reporting what we've learned. And we also have um, an opportunity, depending on how we do this, <laughs> public engagement to broaden our participation, to make sure that maybe people who didn't have particle physics on their radar actually get it on their radar in ways that are accessible. And um, for the last um, um, last two, do you wanna come back? And do you want me to just keep, I can keep going, Karsten? Um, recommendation six, Karsten actually already talked about the panel. We recognized um, that you know, you don't want to have a panel that just spawns panels. That That's a failure of a panel, maybe. But there are some choices that are going to be looming on our horizon as we do this R&D, where we may have endorsed a scientific um, set of requirements and, and opportunities, but the technological details and the feasibility from the um, international perspective hasn't been established. Soon, there are going to be a couple of decision points. And so we have to have, uh, you know, another regrouping when we learn more. Um, I don't want to say more than that, aside from putting you to this um, potential exciting piece of uh, future. So to decode for those of you who aren't particle physics, what do we mean when we say 10 TeV parton center of mass? If you are a particle physicist and you've been thinking about this particular question for a long time, this tells you Oh, uh, 100 TeV proton collider at CERN, the FCC, 90 kilometer tunnel potentially in um, 2070. Or maybe we're talking about colliding fundamental particles, muon collider that might happen on a much smaller footprint, maybe even potentially sited inside the US. We're thinking about trying to access an energy scale that we think will allow us to take a next um, fundamental step in terms of answering our scientific questions, okay? So when people see this 10 TeV parton center of mass energy, it's flashing those particular potential technology directions. And you can imagine there's a lot of discussion in the field about the right way to go forward and what is technologically feasible. We wanna be in a situation where we're able to answer more questions about, okay, how much do things cost? What is feasible, um, et cetera, along this front? So that's um, where this comes from. Carson, do you wanna show these or should we open to, do you wanna do this? Uh, sure. Yeah, maybe just quickly since this also came up. So this is a um, plot that shows you the um, uh, current, funding and projected uh, profile for um, high energy physics under this baseline scenario that we considered. Red is the um, uh, expected envelope. And so uh, the initial bump comes from the Chips and Science Act. And you, you see that roughly there are 30% projects, 30% research, a little bit more than 30% actually. And this, it goes up to 38% yeah, for research and then um, yeah, operations. So the scenario that we outlined really depends on getting this initial bump from um, yeah, the Chips and Science Act. Uh, there is also, of course, the what we call the less favorable scenario, uh, which we were given by DOE if there's just a 2% increase. And uh, the impact of that uh, is shown here. So basically what you see then the erosion of the field over the next decade, uh, unless there are other funds um, yeah, coming yeah, into it. And so uh, this was actually in the charge letter scenario A, and we called it the awful scenario, <laughs> but no one wanted to talk about it. And then in the report, uh, we used the term less favorable. But I actually think it's a euphemism because uh, given where we are with the funding, given where we are in political situations, we don't know where we end up and i think the field has to realize that uh, there could be really uh, hard choices so i show this because um immediately after the presentation of the report last week in washington the last few days we started talking about the rollout activities and the advocacy and everyone who has a stake in the field is now uh, or should be engaged in trying to communicate uh, what we want to do, why it's important. And uh, advocacy for science uh, is something that I hope everyone can engage in. And when we go to Washington, yes, we talk about particle physics or nuclear physics, 
but most importantly, we talk about funding for science. And uh, so if you have an opportunity to participate as a student postdoc or anyone in uh, one of these advocacy days on the Hill or talk about uh, science, it is really um, important. Now, let me just uh, get to the end so we have time for questions. Um, so this is the uh, a table from the summary snow mass document, the 700 pages that uh, uh, Sarah mentioned, where you see major recommendations, ideas that came out of snow mass uh, broken down by the different frontiers. And in our report, we essentially managed to cover most of them as part of um, recommendations. Uh, we have um, essentially recommendations for the energy side, neutrino side, cosmic side, and then we are recommending R&D for yeah, some of the um, yeah, other projects. And uh, let's see with that. Um, I'm not going to go through the different area recommendations. There are a number of detailed recommendations on the different topics that we talked about. You can find them in the report. Um, it was a, a lot of work by a lot of people. Uh, the community really provided excellent uh, input. And so we thank all of them yeah, yeah, for their input and everyone who put up with our endless Zoom calls. And uh, yeah, so um, we uh, yeah presented this, and we have diff different budget scenarios in the report, but I'm not going to show them. And so let's just leave it there and open it up for questions. Thank you. Oh. Um, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, you know, history has shown in high energy physics that if you really want to open up new physics, learn new things, you've got to see the new physics directly. You've got to produce the particles, study their properties. That is, you have to push very hard on the energy part. Mm -hmm. So my question is whether you, I mean, it was very nice to hear what you said at the end, Sarah, about finding and said, do you think the panel has adequately taken that into account that real progress comes from the energy frontier as opposed to kind of, you know, <laughs> chipping away at it with various low energy experiments? Wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. we, should re we should repeat that for yeah. the people on Zoom. Yes, yeah. So Let the, the intensity frontier person say it. Yeah, so the uh, question is whether um, so the first, the comment is that uh, the necessary view about this. Yeah. Question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, it's very good, and I'll I'll have a response to that. So um, the uh, question is that real progress in particle physics has come from seeing things directly, like new particles at the energy frontier. And has the panel has does the plan take adequately into account? this in yeah in yeah our recommendations so um let me first of all say that uh, we um we are seeing particle physics as a field that spans the energy frontier that spans the intensity the you know, neutrinos it spans the yeah, cosmic we do not know where the next discoveries will lie we certainly realize that uh, particle accelerators play a very important role. Uh, we are not yet ready to build the next uh, collider. We are recommending engagement in two important future steps. One is an offshore Higgs factory. And it's clear with the current US budgets, we cannot house it in the US in the next 20 years. That's just not possible given the current commitments. However, there are real proposals and studies going on at CERN, for example, at the CEE. And we will know in a couple of years whether it's feasible technically, financially. And at that point, we recommend this panel that will make um, a decision and recommendation on engagement there or ILC, for example. We also recommend R&D towards um, technologies that could lead us to a muon collider or a 10 TV collider. And there we see actually a potential really interesting synergy. You think about, for example, the neutrino field, Dune will be the ultimate experiment. You can't imagine a super beam experiment going beyond that. 
But if you saw some new physics there or wanted to bring that together with the energy frontier, a muon collider actually provides you access to a lot of interesting studies. Now, we have to be honest that right now, we do not know whether we can build a muon collider, what it takes financially and technically. I mean, there's been enormous progress on different accelerator collider RDs, but uh, whether this gets to the point where we can actually envision a full collider, that remains to be seen. So I think within all of these boundary constraints, we have recommended a pretty aggressive uh, R&D path that explores option towards the future. Um, so I think that's, and certainly when we presented in the last few days, the, um, the community around the Neon Collider and the Energy Frontier seem pretty excited about that option. But we have to be realistic that we don't know, not know if there's a path and if it's financially uh, feasible. And if there's no future collider, this could be the death of particle physics, but you also have, for example, the cosmic side. We might find things there. And that's why we felt that having a broad balanced approach might give us actually the best chance of discovery. Yes. Uh, so, Ever, question for you. So, can you go back to slide 29? That's the one where you give the recommendations of, I think, uh, now. Okay, no, no, that, that one. Which one? Uh, the next one. It's like small scale. So I guess as a former Dune person, um, why uh, is the, what was the train of thought between having this recommendation of having the, uh, like the beam and then the third bar detector? What's like, what's the, what do you gain? In, especially with the monetary constraints of doing that versus uh, funding something else. Taking into account that you have Hyper-K, T2K, Nova already in the recommendations. Yeah. So uh, doing as the, the biggest project that the US has ever undertaken, I mean, to study neutrino oscillations, understand the mass hierarchy, go up to some violations. It, is, it has two phases. Two detectors are currently being built as far detectors away from the Fermi Lab complex. And they propose to have two more detectors, detector three and four, in addition to um, your beam upgrade. So when we on the panel analyzed it, uh, we realized that if you only have one additional detector and you boost the accelerator, complex early, then you get the same, roughly the same exposure as two far detectors with the original client. So that, uh, that's essentially in the uh, two curves shown here. Uh, the blue curve is what the uh, 2014 P5 had in its plan. So the accelerator boost would come late and you have two far detectors. We decided if we recommend it early, then only have one additional part detector, you almost get the same um, exposure. So the same, the same exposure means similar sensitivity yeah, to the MCP violation. We also reframe the science case for Dune. We see it as not just going after CP violation, but really a comprehensive test of three flavor neutrino oscillation. So in that sense, yes, Hyper-K is optimized for CP violation. They might, uh, uh, see that early, but if you really wanted to test all the parameters of neutrino oscillations, uh, this is um, uh, yeah, real path towards that. And the first phase of doing that's currently underway might give you a five sigma definitive statement on the mass hierarchy, which would be important for cosmology. So uh, this is the rationale behind. Um, Dune and what we are recommending there, trying to realize the full program of Dune, what was envisioned with um, <laughs> more economical. Economical in hmm. yeah. Yeah, quotation marks. Yes, Dyson. Um, I think the recommendations for um, prioritizing CMPS4 is quite exciting development. At the same time, I think that's one of many puzzling frontier experiments. Um, I'd like to ask if you can comment on how this particular recommendation fits in the landscape 
a broader portfolio of cosmic frontier that is really amazing and busy, proven, which has already been being funded. So maybe that is already off the table in terms of recommendation, but it's still good to think about in the context of broader cosmic frontier, how CMBS4 fits in. My second question is funding. Uh, I think that this is partly a, a probably a proposal for getting funding from DOE, but I think the Cosmic Frontier also um, has the multi-agency strategies for getting funding from NSF. Could you perhaps comment also on the multi-agency initiatives? On Absolutely. Yeah, so there are a couple of uh, things in your question. First of all, uh, Rudin is underway, and in our first uh, rec recommendation, we state very clearly that this should be supported and completed, and of course, our operations are here to science out, and uh, this is part of essentially recommendation one. CMBS4 is covered as one of the major new initiatives. So when we thought about projects, we uh, looked at everything above 250 million as being a major project, a large uh, project. CMBS4 falls uh, under that. And so it's in the same category as doing as uh, yeah, LHC projects, um, et cetera. We saw the science of CMBS4 as uh, uh, compelling, unique. We um, found that project is essentially ready as one of the very mature cost estimates. There is a risk and uncertainty associated with this, and that is being at the South Pole, the South Pole infrastructure, uh, have, there have been some uh, challenges, but by also placing CMBS4 as one of our top recommendations, we wanted to make, make sure that there's enough pressure and support to, uh, yeah. to maintain the South Pole as one of the unique sites for science. Basically, you need the South Pole because the inflation signs if you just do CMBS4, essentially on the Chilean side, you, you can get an effective, yeah, all of this. But if you want to get the full science program, um, yeah, on the CMB, then uh, you need the South Pole at that side. So the fact that it's at the South Pole and CMBS4 is essentially half funded DOE and nominally half NSF poses a particular challenge, coordination between agencies. On top of that, NSF. Uh, you're dealing with a number of offices. You are dealing with um, physics and astronomy. It's two offices. Plus, you're dealing with the Office of Polar Program. And um, through many conversations and discussions, we have learned uh, how much communication or non-communication there is. Uh, and uh, so we have seen progress, good progress over the last few months within NSF, full support meetings. And we hope that with this recommendation, this actually can become reality. Um, on your other questions, DESI 2 is covered on the medium scale projects. So it's below 250 million. We recommend uh, DESI 2. Uh, Spec S5 is something that was not quite ready for prime time, but we recommend R&D. So basically you have then surveys to do yeah, cosmic evolution. Uh, yeah, both of them um, yeah, going forward in the next uh, and so spec S5, if the R&D is done now, then towards the end of the decade, should be yeah, perhaps ready for construction. And we also have uh, a more favorable budget scenario that we were not asked to consider, but we decided for ourselves. We wanted to dream a little bit too, and not just think about cuts. And uh, we made comments there about where to invest if there's additional money. So, uh, I wanted to I always wonder, like in some experiments, right? You have like nuclear physics, you know, Alice experiment, and then you have Atlas and the same accelerator, right? But in US, mostly, you like, say, okay, that's the high energy physics accelerator, this is nuclear physics accelerator. They just don't go together. But since you mentioned like the muon collider, right? Because there's a lot of interest in the EIC community towards the muon collider. And if it's interested to the high energy physics community as well, so is there like anything, is it like something which is possible in the US or, or, like, or is there any recommendation in that direction? Uh, so Couple, like, I mean, basically that's what I mean. Yeah, so if I understand your uh, question correctly, it's about yeah the interplay between the different communities uh, yeah, on these accelerators, yes. So um, 
uh, it's certainly true that things like LHC or um, yeah, Fermilab with Dune are now targeted towards certain countries. At the um, yeah, EIC, you can also envision a high energy oriented uh, physics program. Um, that is a separate uh, topic. We certainly recognize physics opportunities there, but we do not make any comments or recommendations about investments there. It is a nuclear physics uh, led project. We talk about the synergy strongly in the workforce, especially in the accelerator technology, because accelerator technology, whether it's development for the EIC or other mm -hmm. providers, there are many synergies in the R&D. And it actually turns out that the workforce is, uh, is the same. The people that, uh, that used to build and used to work in uh, Slack and Fermilab are now moving to Brookhaven, <laughs> yeah, to work with the EIC and develop the EIC there. And uh, there seems to be also a little bit more overlap. And we recommend also, um, uh, yeah, we see the value in coordination there, just to also maintain the accelerator. I mean, not only accelerator, but on the detector RD sites too. I mean, it's identically the same technology. It's literally hard to know difference between these two. And that sort of, if there is like some way to sort of marry these two community, I think uh, that might be instructive. Well, that's, uh, that is important. Uh, the separation in the offices, especially uh, DOE, is something that uh, is, a, is, a, is a reality. And uh, we're trying to work within that while recognizing that it's clearly you know, overlapping. Yeah. At the beginning, um, you mentioned like building a particle accelerator on the moon. Was that just like an example, or was that actually <laughs> that was the that was the one that's not in the snowmass proposal? Except um, James Beecham has a whole talk about about building an accelerator on the moon. So if you Google it, you will find a nice presentation that 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 outlines that. Yeah, I mean, and, and actually to Tom's point about um, the energy frontier, you know, I, I think one of the ways that we're trying to be really good stewards of this frontier is to not drop lines of inquiry in accelerator R and D right now. We're hanging on to Wakefield acceleration. We're, you know, plasmas, using plasma to accelerate. We're hanging on to C cubed, new copper cu um, cooling. So, so all of these great ideas that might mean that the energy frontier does not require bigging, digging a bigger and bigger tunnel, Tom. Let's bring our costs down and, and let's, you know, and so all of that we're really pushing. And I think that that gives the energy frontier community a lot of excitement because it does mean that, you know, we follow this plan and we will make things possible that right now are just our hopes and dreams. And, and that hopefully will be what avoids what I think you use the word death of particle. You know what I mean? That's how we're being good stewards is we're going to chase it. Let's make this less expensive, smaller, um, so that we can go after the, the higher and higher center mass energies. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, there are but budget realities, but I think they're really exciting opportunities and we have to see, yeah, what pans out over the next uh, decade. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I think we have think, coffee, speaking of energy. I think, yes, we have coffee and uh, cookies uh, if you need to refuel. Uh, thank you all. Um, we have a website. There's a two-pager if your attention span is... Uh, for a two-pager, you, you can read the bullet points and get the gist of the report. And um, yeah, I hope uh, I hope it'll excite uh, some of you to think about particle physics. Thank you, Jen. <laughs>